that bad habits are kind of like those flowers. They're easy to get rid of. Bless you. Um, they're, they're like those uh, plants that, you know what, it's going to take a little effort to get some of those bad habits out of the way. And sometimes you got to strain. But sometimes there are like habits that we have. They can actually be like strongholds, you know, strongholds in our lives. And so um, we want to focus on 2022, basically trying to get rid of the bad habits. I should rephrase that. Because you can't get rid of bad habits. They don't just disappear. Researchers have studied this immensely. They don't just disappear. But what has to happen is you have to develop a new pathway. You have to develop new habits to, to help you, you know. Um, you have to take that exit on the freeway that's a, that's a better one. Because those old habits, because they've been ingrained in you, they will always be there. And so you have to spend time carving new habits in your life. I mean, think about like when you go on a diet, right? That's what everybody does during New Year. They eat too much food. I did the same thing in Minnesota. Uh, I have an excuse, so it was negative 32 degrees where I was, and uh, I couldn't go outside. I couldn't exercise. I was stuck in the house, and, uh, you know, Michelle's mom has food that just falls from heaven. It's all over the place there. <laughs> so had to be a good uh, guest and eat. But anyway, the point is, is that we, we struggle with our weight sometimes, and then we, we find this new pathway, right? Whether it's being a vegan, whether it's kind of this new low-carb diet, or whatever it is, you know, juicing, uh, you know, <laughs> making smoothies and replacing meals and things like that. And, you know, often when we go that direction, we're, we're pleased with the results that we get. We're like, I'm losing weight. But then what happens? Those old habits. Old habits are still there, you know? It's kind of like someone that takes a, an exit, right? This exit is, is, is the key for you to develop good habits like in your diet, right? And then you're like driving and driving, and you're like, oh, man, I've lost the weight that I'm supposed to lose. And then all of a sudden you start saying, okay, I'm going to go back on the freeway. And you start going towards that exit again. And, you know, it takes a while to get to that exit, right? And, and when, we, when we, you know, change our program, we're like, okay, I can eat a little bit more. I can eat a little bit differently, a little differently. And the next thing you know, you're back out on that freeway. Uh, and, and you have those bad habits that are happening. So the bad habits that I want to talk about today, because we're creatures of habit, Right? We, we, sometimes we just do the same things over and over again without even thinking about it. Sometimes we're on autopilot. And what I want to focus on for 2022 is spiritual habits. I really want to focus on our spiritual habits this year because some of us have good habits and others have terrible habits. And perhaps one of the most difficult habit that we have sometimes is when it comes to talking to God. Sometimes we don't talk to God enough. Reminds me of this story about this pastor and taxi driver that died on the same day and went to heaven. So... St. Peter is like giving out rewards, saying, well done, good and faithful servant. So he goes to the taxi driver and he says, you know, for your work that you've done, here is a satin robe and a golden stash. And then he looks at the pastor and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. So what I'm going to give you today is I'm going to give you a cotton robe and a wooden stash. All of a sudden, the taxi driver looks at the guy and says, hey, wait a minute. I've been a pastor for over 50 years at the same church. I have been faithful. And how was it that you give this taxi driver a better award than I do? St. Peter looks at him and says, well, 
in heaven, we go by results. And when you were a pastor, you didn't pray much, but you preached a lot. And most of your folks were asleep. But when that taxi driver drove down New York City, people would call my name and ask me to save them. (laughs) Prayer, right? God likes people that pray. He doesn't like people that talk too much sometimes as I look at my watch. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about prayer. I want to look at kind of like trying to get this pathway back again, starting off New Year, like in this kind of mindset that says, you know what, I'm going to talk. Because how many know that if you have a relationship with somebody and you don't talk to them, it's not a very deep relationship. Think about like when you were dating someone for the first time and you didn't know what to say. If you were like me, man, like with Michelle, it's like, oh, I don't know what to say to her, you know? So I, I, I got like on the computer. And I'm like, I was writing down questions. I'm going to ask her this question and this question and this question, and I'm going to put it in my pocket when I print it out in case I forget which questions I was going to ask. And so there was like a concerted effort to communicate, right? To communicate. But what happens sometimes even in relationships is once you get the girl, you get the guy, then you start going back on that exit that leads back to the highway. And I feel like that's what happens to a lot of Christians sometimes, you know? You start off gung-ho, you're, you're praying all the time, you're feeling good. But then as you have been in the faith for years and years and years. Maybe you feel secure in your faith. You start to believe to yourself that, well, you know, I go to church. I read my Bible sometimes. I don't pray as much. You know what happens to Christians? We get distracted. Seriously, We get distracted, right, because we live in this culture, this world, right, that that distracts us. And so whatever your vice is, whether it's social media, whether it's investing, um, whether it's like being in certain clubs or organizations, whether it's watching TV, just kind of relaxing, or just simply wasting time, right? Our culture provides this opportunity for us to get distracted. And I think what happens in relationships, like this relationship with God, is that we stop praying to him as much as we need to because we get distracted in life. Other things have got our attention. There are other things that are more interesting to us. And we have like all kinds of reasons and excuses why our prayer life isn't good. But the bottom line is that that's how you have a relationship. Is you're involved in prayer. You're involved in talking. And in the course of that relationship, you're also seeking to kind of hear, what does God want in my life? You know, there are a lot of people sometimes that will say, man, I pray, I just don't hear from God. But maybe their prayer is like praying for the dinner meal. You know, that happens to us, doesn't it? Sometimes our prayer is limited to God bless this food to our body. And if you're really hungry, you're like, God bless this food to our body. Jesus, amen. Amen. I mean, sometimes you're like, you, you have that fork going towards your mouth, like, God, thank you for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> then you burp. You know, when Corbin was little, Corbin would be at the dinner table. I'd say, who wants to pray? He said, I want to pray. Probably like three, four, five years old. I can't remember. I'd say, God... Thank you for my French fries. Thank you for the ketchup that goes on my French fries. Thank you for 
the Diet Coke that my mom drinks. Thank you for the food that my dad's eating, though it doesn't look very good. I would never eat it, but thank you for that food for him. Thank you for the salt. Thank you for the pepper. We'd be like, oh, man, he's just going to keep going on and on and on. Now I can't get him to pray at all. And and it, it, it happens, you know. It happens to Christians as well. And so Jesus has a couple things to say. And I don't have the clicker, Jim, so you're just going to have to help me out. But I don't have many slides, so you're in good shape. Uh, Jesus wants us to get our prayer life right. And and, and there are certain things that he says here. Uh, One of them, when it comes to praying, he says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. It's kind of interesting. I've been to Israel, and sometimes I look out the window, like, early in the morning, and I see, like, a person on this corner with the prayer shawl on. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I think this is kind of what Jesus is communicating here, is that some people just pray on the street corners And have this shawl on, which symbolizes what? I'm praying. Right? That's that's what a prayer shawl symbolizes. And then they start doing this number. Jesus says that we can be hypocrites in prayer. Have you guys ever known people that, like, they are kind of proud of praying in front of you. Maybe they have some kind of charismatic slant or maybe they just have these big old words, right? I I had a pastor one time and he would pray to the Lord at the end of the service. Oh God, thee are so great and thou thank you and thou thankest you and, you know, I'm glad that, uh, you know, you you rose Lazarus when he stinketh and... um, But the point is simply, prayer is talking to God. You know, my pastor never prayed to me or talked to me in King James. And sometimes we forget that, right? The the word pray sometimes, it just kind of makes people feel like, well, what's the way that you do this? It's talking to God. And there's all these fancy words like, okay, this one is adoration, this one is intercession, you know, this one is supplication. But it's like when you talk to people, do you think about that? Like, do you go up to Bob and say, hey, Bob, I'm going to supplicate you today. You know, I'm talking to you in intercession, Bob. No, you, you just talk, right? You just talk, and sometimes we make it so difficult. But So, so Jesus is, is very concerned about people that have wrong motives when it comes to praying. He does like hypocrites. You know, interesting, I was reading this morning that um, in the Republic of Iran, Islamic Iran, you know, they, they go by these heavy codes, and, and, and some of them say, like, if someone fornicates, they get 100 lashes in public. If they commit adultery... They get stoned. And then all of a sudden, I was reading about these people. They're called mullahs. And what mullahs do is they just kind of like run kind of the organization, but they came up with this thing called temporary marriage. And for a certain amount of money, you have the permission to marry someone for a couple of minutes all the way up to 99 years. And the reason is, is so that men and women can fulfill their sexual desires. And they tried to ban this several times, but when it came to push comes to shove, they're like, you know, this is necessary for our public because you can't have premarital sex. And so the only way that we could come across this is simply to allow people to have temporary marriages that can last for a couple of minutes, and then it's, it's, it's dissolved. See, I think Jesus would look at that and say, you know, that's, that's hypocritical. 
It's hypocritical. And, and Jesus really cares about how we live our life and, and how we act. And he said, don't pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that, that they may be seen by others. Don't, your whole purpose is not to be seen by others. He says, truly I say to you, they have received their reward, right? And what is their reward? I'm impressing you. You see how spiritual I am. I'm impressing you. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. It's probably a reference to he will answer your prayers because your, your heart is right, your heart is pure. How he answers prayers, you know, when God answers prayers, he doesn't always answer them the way that we want them to be. We, we had the steak and study the other day, and I was just kind of playing around with, you know, the men there, and I was like, okay, I want you to raise your hand if God answered your prayer how you wanted it to pray 100% of the time. Well, 75% of the time, people weren't raising their hands. And then I said 50% of the time, and I caught Daryl do this. <laughs> I figured Daryl was thinking, is it 47, 48, 49%? <laughs> But the point is, is that God does answer our prayers, but he doesn't often answer them exactly how we want them to be, right? Some of you are with your spouse, and you probably prayed for somebody else at one point. And you thought, man, this is the right person. This is what I want God to do. I will be so happy. And God is like, you're lucky I rescued you. You're lucky you have your wife and your husband that you have now. Because God knows better than we do, Right? And sometimes, like, people speak for God and say, God will do this for you. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to make that mistake. God will answer your prayer, but I don't know if he's going to answer your prayer exactly as you want them to be answered. But what God cares about is your, is your countenance, is your, your desire to pray. And, and that's what I love about my sister Irene so much is that she has a heart for prayer. She tells me at midnight she gets up at midnight, and she's praying. How many of us are doing that? But she's praying in private. And she probably would tell me, Pastor, you didn't have to tell people that when I get done. Well, forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm using it to illustrate that Jesus likes those prayers in secret. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and they're not just prayers that are trite prayers or, you know, don't have a lot of meaning. I mean, I grew up as a non-Christian, you know. My mom was Catholic, and every night it's like, now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless mom, dad, Kenny, Ricky, all my loads of friends. In Jesus' name, amen. And then when I was uh, uh, in my 20s, early 20s, I wasn't a Christian. Then I would say, and Lord, I just pray that I don't die. <laughs> I would say that. And I, I would repeat the same thing every day, and I did it for like over 25 years. And so that's kind of what he's getting to right now because then he goes, and when you pray, do not heap on empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Do not be like them. Your father knows what is, which you need before you ask him. How many people know that? Your father knows what you need before you ask him. And it's not always what you think you need. Amen? But he knows exactly what you need. He knows what you need. And then he goes on. And he tells us a short prayer. Not a long prayer, but a short prayer. It's a prayer that many of us understand. 
And when you look at this prayer, it's not just meant to be something that you regurgitate over and over again like I did now, lay me down and sleep, I pray the Lord will soul keep. But it's, it's really kind of this model. And really you can like focus on key aspects of this when you pray. When I go on my prayer walks, I, I pray this prayer, but I, I personalize every single component of this prayer. Uh, just to kind of break this prayer down, it's broken down um, in, in three times the focus is on God. It's like providential prayer. And then the next three times, it's focused on us. And just from that, that very reference point, it gives you an idea that is your prayer life balanced? What does your prayer life look like in the 50% you know, category? So Jesus starts out and says, you know, the first thing you have to do before you pray for yourself, and you have to train yourself to develop this good habit, is you got to pray to God first. So he starts out by saying, our Father in heaven, Think about that. The creator of the universe, the creator of everything that you see has given you the right to call him Father. In the Arabic, it's Abba, which means Daddy. He's given you permission to call him Daddy. And you know why Daddy is so beautiful? Because it's so personal. My kids never called me Daddy, but they used to call me Dada. Dada, Mama. I would go up to Michelle and I said, don't you wish they would call you Mommy? And I kind of wish they would call me Daddy. Michelle would say, no, I, I like Mama. Be like sometimes 9, 10 at night, or maybe it's that they had a dream in the morning. Dad, Mama. And you know what we did? It was a pleasure to get up and say, what is it that you need? How can I help you? And so Jesus gives us permission, says, okay, when you're praying, you're not just praying to an Elohim, which means God. Because how many times do people throw that word around, oh, God did this and God did that, right? We were talking about this at the men's stake and study too, is that too many times we don't call God Lord. And Lord is, comes from the Hebrew Yahweh. And he tells Moses, when they ask you who sent you, tell them Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And not only can you call him Yahweh, but Jesus says, now we can call him Abba. We can call him Father. And before we get too comfortable, Jesus says, hallowed be your name. In, in other words, may you be glorified, may you be reverenced, may you be esteemed. So, so that's the first aspect of this prayer when it comes to God is we have to know who God is, who it is that we're praying to. And sometimes we just want to pray for what we want so much that we don't even think about it. Hallowed be your name. You've had a human father. Human fathers can be wonderful. Some of us have had fathers that weren't very nice. But your heavenly father is perfect, and his love for you is eternal. And he'll always want the best for you. Next thing Jesus says is, Let's talk about your business, God. Because how many times do we pray to God and we care about our business? And so Jesus says, 
this is God's business, right? And this sometimes is maybe why we don't get what we want is we're so focused on our business, but Jesus says, pray this, like, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where do we live? Earth, right? What is Jesus saying? God, may your will, not my will, be done. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. God, I want you to to, to affect me so much that I represent the kingdom of heaven on earth. And that's what we're called to do. Like as Christians, you read about in the Bible, uh, there's, there's that term kingdom of God, and it's not really talked about a lot in the church, but Jesus says that all the time. Kingdom of God is here. Kingdom of God is here, but it's in the future. Kingdom of God is now. We're part of the kingdom. We're part of this kingdom that God said, okay, I want you guys to go out there and establish this kingdom. I want you to go out and talk to people and share about me, and I want you to disciple someone like me so that they can go make disciples of other things because I want to build my kingdom, and when I come back, I'm coming back for my kingdom. It doesn't say my kingdom come. My will be done. This is your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's one of the reasons why I believe in signs and wonders. Because they're supposed to be a reflection of heaven, right? There's no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. There's healing of the nations healing of the heart. You know, there's not going to be people there that have leprosy or have cancer. And so anytime someone gets healed of cancer, like Cheryl Aramaki or Melinda Hotkin, Haka, it's an example of what heaven's going to be like. There's got to be no more sickness, no more pain like that. No more death that cancer can claim. And when, when this happens on earth, it's a, it's a little taste of heaven. It's a shadow of heaven. He goes on to say, give us this day our daily bread. This comes back to now our petitions. So the first petition that he's saying is, it's okay for you to ask for provision. It's okay, you're supposed to do that. It's just that sometimes that's the number one thing on our agenda. And so God wants to bless us. He wants us to provide for us, right? It's like when my kid says, Dad, it's like, how can I serve you? I feel like some of those prophets, here I am. (laughs) I need some water. You know, if my friend called me in the middle of the night and said, Come here, quick, quick, quick. And I went there, and I'm like, what's wrong, what's wrong? I "I need some water. I'm like, are you kidding me? You want water? But not my son. How can I serve you? Yes, yes, I'm going to get you some water because I know that you wouldn't have called me in the middle of the night unless you were, maybe you were scared to go to where the water fountain is. You know? God cares about provision for us. But when provision is your only means, then there comes a problem, right? Because then you're saying, God, I want you to establish my kingdom and my will. God cares about your provision. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to flourish. And if you have resources, he doesn't care if you're rich. What he cares about is what do you do with that richness? What do you do with that money? Are you a steward of my money? Because ultimately, whatever we have, it's, it belongs to God. That beautiful parsonage that's being built out there, right? That's not, that's not my parsonage. It belongs to the church, right? And what do we do? Because Michelle and I are essentially stewards. We're going to use that house to have you guys over. 
We're going to use that house to glorify God and, and the kingdom. We'll still live in that house, and we'll still have our private times, but this is, this is how God wants us to live. And so he says, and then he goes, okay, also forgive our debts. Today I googled the national deficit. And it, it was like this, this website that was like an ongoing timer. And so it said 29 trillion, 750 million, and it was still, <laughs> it was still going like this. It, it didn't stop. It just it kept accumulating, you know, so pretty soon it's going to be more than what I read. But 27 or 29 0.7 trillion dollars. That's a lot of money that we owe our creditors as a country. As substantial as that number is, your debt to God is far greater than that. You owe God far more than that because of what he did in Jesus Christ. And when he forgave you, he forgave you an amount way beyond $29.7 trillion. And then once you grasp how much he's forgiven you, then Jesus says, forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Okay, now you're stepping on toes. Because we want the forgiveness, but often there are people that are in our lives, family members, co-workers, that we don't want to forgive. And Jesus talks about this a lot in parables, you know, about this, this ruler who forgave debts, and then the person that he forgave had someone that owed him money, and he got upset. <laughs> See, the very notion of us being forgiven for our debt is to be so appreciative of that that if someone offends us through the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to forgive them, to free them of their debt. And forgiveness costs something. If someone has stolen from me, like, say they stole, I don't know, um, say they stole a guitar. I don't play an instrument, but say they stole my guitar. My guitar was $350. It's a cheap guitar, probably, Nathaniel. But anyway, and then he damaged it, broke it. By nature, I'm upset because he stole from me, right? And so I have the choice, like, okay, I want you to pay me back. But if, if, if I have him pay me back, am I forgiving him? No. And, and, and even further, right, what if I say, okay, you know what? I forgive you. I, I forgive you. Then all of a sudden, I have to go out and buy another guitar for $350. I forgave this person, and I incurred a cost. That doesn't seem fair. That's what Jesus did for you. He died for you, took away all your sins, and he incurred a cost for you. And so when we say to people, I don't want to forgive you, we forget what fact that Jesus did for us. And then he says, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one, depending on what you like. And that's important because that's a, re a realization that there is a spiritual realm that's out there that's evil. 
And sometimes we, all, we just look at people thinking, oh, that person's evil, right? But there's, there's always something behind it. Remember we were talking about angels and principalities and dominion and, you know, there's, there's always an influence behind, you know, all your political figures, uh, all the stuff that you see that's going on in Disney, right? We're talking about Disney at, at the prayer conference. And it's like, man, Disney is like promoting witchcraft in a lot of their movies. And they're pulling away a lot of Christ-centered positions. I was told now that Spider-Man's going to become bisexual. Superheroes. When you watch TV, like we watch This Is Us, you see one of our favorite shows, A Million Little Things. They have transsexuals. They have their kids that, you know, one's gay. And it's like, it's so promoted, right? And then we have the media, and the media is telling us, like, even the stuff about COVID, right? It, it's, it's, it's meant to completely fear you. Somehow to control your thoughts, paralyze you. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. But, but you have to be aware that there is evil, right? And then the interesting thing about this passage is Jesus isn't done. Uh, you know, most translations, they have, you know, for thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. We love how that ends, right? But that's only in some translations. Did you know that? Some of the earliest manuscripts don't have that little crescendo. But it has this. Jesus tells us how to pray, and then he gets right back to this issue. He says, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others your, their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. And if you're like me when I first read this for the first time, that made me mad. I'm like, that can't be true. Right? Jesus died for me. I'm forgiven. And now all of a sudden, if I can't forgive somebody, then this means that he's not going to forgive me. But he goes back. He just finished this. Right? He just finished talking about forgiveness. But he goes back to say one more thing before I'm done. While you're singing for thine is the power and the glory forever and ever, amen, I want you to know that if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And you want to know why? Because Christians that can't forgive may actually be professing Christians but not true believers of Jesus Christ that are spirit-filled and led by the Holy Spirit. It's true. Now, forgiveness is a hard thing. But Jesus seems to indicate, do you realize how much it cost me do you realize the cost that I have incurred to forgive you and set you free so that you can not only be somebody who's going to heaven, but you're an heir, and you're allowed to call the God that created this world Father, Yahweh, Lord. And you mean to tell me that you can't forgive somebody else? Just something to think about. We're not talking about priests in the Catholic Church here. I understand that sometimes they use this passage here. But, but this is Jesus that's communicating this truth. And it's like, how do you wrestle with it? And really the only way to wrestle with it, like if you can't forgive somebody, you don't really appreciate that you've been forgiven. You don't know the degree that you've been forgiven. I'm not saying that you become best friends with people. 
But I'm saying that, you know, when Jesus is talking about prayer, you know, one of the things that he says is remember to ask God to forgive you or to confess, but also you have to take ownership in this. You need to forgive those that have trespassed against you. Because that is an example to the world, to people that know there's conflict there of the Holy Spirit working in your life. That is an example of that. And, and maybe the Holy Spirit is kind of stirring you up right now. Maybe you know some people that you really haven't forgiven. And, and if the Holy Spirit is stirring you up, that's a good thing because it's telling you that, hey, man, he's still there, right? It's when you have no care. It's like when I counsel couples. If I have a couple that comes in that they're, they're going through marriage hardships and they're yelling at each other, I'm like, man, there, there's hope. There's still hope. But when they come in and they don't say very much, they don't feel, they don't care, I'm like, this relationship is probably finished unless God can somehow miraculously come into their lives and change them. And you ask any counselor, and they'll tell you the same thing. They'd rather have the yelling and the name-calling and the emotions because they recognize that there's still a connection there. And so I just close right now by saying to you all that 2022, where's your connection to God? How's it doing? Have you, are you talking to God? And, and maybe you're mad at God right now. Oh, man, we had a speaker here yesterday. Oh, my goodness. He, his daughter got hit by an 18-wheeler. She was killed. And he talked about the pain that happened. And he said, why me? It's not fair. And then somehow he was able to say, God gave me 20 years. 20 years with this beautiful person. I wanted more. but God is still good. Then he went on to share he couldn't have a kid for 10 more years. 10 years later, he has an autistic kid. And he's like, why do I have an autistic kid? And the autistic kid had seizures he told me that this kid would have up to 35 seizures a day. And so they had to, like, make a decision about parts of the brain that are connected to disconnect it so that this child would not have any seizures. And the consequence of that was, and they knew it, wouldn't be able to talk to them anymore wouldn't be able to talk to him. And he said, why? How could you do this? And then he had a dream. A dream about his son talking. He believes his son's going to talk. And he will, whether it's going to be here or in heaven. But in the meantime, he's going to love his son. 
And he's going to live off that hope that one day he will be able to talk to him again. Because God is good. Why do things happen to us? I don't know. But it's like Job, right? Job talks to his wife and says, shall we accept only the good from God but not the bad or the wicked? You're a foolish woman. Sometimes all you can do is just live in your faith. Believe in your faith because there's no other thing that can help you. And those kinds of people, man, they talk to God like you wouldn't believe. Don't wait for a tragedy to happen before you talk to God. Develop those habits that, you know, when things are going good in your life, you'll talk to God. Don't wait for the tragedy. So this year, I just, I encourage you guys to commit yourself. Find a a time that works best for you to pray, whether it's early morning, afternoon, nighttime. Turn off the phone, the TV, anything that hinders you. If you have children, say, hey, you know what? Don't bother me for a certain amount of time. Spend some time thanking God for everything that he's done. Spend some time saying, my Father is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me today this daily bread because I need provision in my life. I need something. Leave me not into temptation. Forgive my debts as I forgive the debts of others. For thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.